All right, so last time we talked about the notion of a product. Now, in the category of contracts and guarded functions, a product is a tuple. But this is just a special case. Um, we're going to see that products are much more general and turn up lots of concepts that we already know and use regularly in computer science and math. So I'm going to start with the simplest one. The simplest one lives in, an, in a category where the objects are numbers. So the objects are numbers. And the morphisms are relations that one object is less than or equal to another number. One number, one object is less than or equal to another object. So whereas in JavaScript, our objects are contracts, here our objects are numbers. Note this is not the contract for a number. That is one object that accepts a, uh, that describes a whole set of values. Here, the number one is an object, just like int32 is an object in our other category. And instead of having guarded functions, we just say there is an arrow from, say, 3 to 5 because 3 is less than or equal to 5. So instead of having a type or a contract, we have a number. And instead of a guarded function, we just have this relationship, this less than or equal to relationship. Now note that just like functions, we can compose the less than or equal to relationship. If 3 is less than or equal to 5, and 5 is less than or equal to 9, then we can compose these two and get that 3 is less than or equal to 9. We also have the notion of an identity. 3 to 3. There's always an identity guarded function from any contract to itself. Similarly here, 3 is less than or equal to itself. Okay? So this is a different category than the one we've been using in JavaScript, but it's still a category. Now, for the minimum. The minimum of A and B is a number, so it's an object in our category, that is less than or equal to A. It is less than or equal to B. But it's not any old number that's less than or equal to A and B. It's the biggest number that is less than or equal to A and B. So if we have for any other number, z, it's less than or equal to a, less than or equal to b, this number z has to be less than or equal to this one, because this is the biggest one. So say a is 3 again and b is 5. Now well, if we could choose any old number that was less than both of them, we could choose 1, right? But then we could choose a competitor. And let's call this one 2. Well, 2 is less than or equal to 3. 2 is less than or equal to 5. But 2 is not less than or equal to 1. So 1 cannot be the minimum. Now, of course, we know the minimum is 3, and so the best competitor we can get here is 3. 3 is less than or equal to 3. 
3 is less than or equal to 5, and 3 is less than or equal to 3. If we make this any bigger, it won't satisfy this condition. If we make this one any smaller, it won't satisfy this condition. So this is the largest number that has these two arrows. All right. Now another example. Again, our objects are going to be numbers, um, but they'll be natural numbers. I used natural numbers last time, but I could have used reals. Here I want natural numbers. And our morphisms, instead of less than or equal to, is going to be, is a factor of, divides. Now, unfortunately, the, the usual symbol for division in math collides with the uh, bitwise operator OR in most C-like programming languages, and it's symmetric about this axis, so it's useless as an arrow. So what I'm going to do is draw an arrow through the middle of it, and this says, if I write A divides B, that means A is a factor of B. Okay. So, what do we get out of this? Well, we're going to write the product, and without telling you in advance what it is, I'm just going to write a P here. The product of A and B is a number. This product is a factor of A, and the product is a factor of B, but it's going to be the largest factor of A and B. That means for any other number Z, that is a factor of A, and a factor of b, z is going to be a factor of this thing. Well, factors are also called divisors. And being a divisor of both a and b, it is a common divisor. But it's not any old common divisor, it is the greatest common divisor. So the product in this category is gcd the greatest common divisor. So say a is 6 and b is 9. Well, we need a divisor of 6 and 9. Well, let's say we choose 1. But then we can choose a competitor, 3. 3 is a factor of 6, 3 is a factor of 9, but 3 is not a factor of 1. So 1 cannot be the greatest common divisor of those. In fact, it is 3. If this were any larger than 3, it would not be a factor of 6 and it would not be, or it would not be a factor of 9. I could choose, for example, 6, which is a factor of 6, but 6 is not a factor of 9, so I can't use that. So 3 is the best the competitor can do. It's as large as it can get. And 3 is as small as the product can be. If it's any smaller, I can use 3 as the competitor. So 3 is the greatest common divisor of 6 and 9. So we've seen that the minimum can be expressed as a product. The greatest common divisor can be expressed as a product. Let's look at another category. Here we have, we're back in the realm of contracts again. So we have contract A and B, so our objects, our contracts, and our morphisms, instead of being guarded functions, they're going to be inclusions. So if we have an inclusion from A to B, 
That means it's got to look like this. Function x return b of a of x. So on the input we get it has to pass the contract A, but we can't change it at all before we pass it to the contract B. That is, the things that A accepts have to be a subset of the things that B accepts. So this is a special kind of guarded function, a special case that I'm drawing like this. It's called an inclusion. So what do we get with an inclusion? The product of A and B is an inclusion into A. So it has to pass the A contract and it has to pass the B contract. But it's going to be the most lenient contract, the one that accepts the most values. So for any other contract Z, with an inclusion to A and an inclusion to B, this Z is going to be included in this. So in other words, if these are the set of values that pass the contract A, and these are the set of values that con pass the contract B, then this region is P of A and B, that is, it's the intersection of those two sets. And given any other contract Z that passes both A and B, it's got to be included in this largest one. So here, product of A and B is the intersection of A and B. Now I said all these were more general cases of pairs. Let's see how pairs work. So our objects are contracts. And our morphisms are guarded functions. Guarded functions. So the product of A and B is a contract. Together with a function that I'll call first from this contract to that contract. That is, it expects a tuple in where the first element passes A and the second element passes B and the output passes A. So of course what we can do is take the first element of that pair and return it. Similarly here, second we can get something of type B. But it's not any old contract with functions to A and B. It's a special one. So if we have F here and G, then there's a unique, there exists a unique map that we're going to call product of F and G. There's a unique map that's this thing that when I apply it to Z I get a pair and then I can project off the first and second elements and get 
the same value as if I applied F to Z. So if I have some contract here, if I apply F to one of those elements, and I apply G to, what, to that same element, and I pair them up, that's what this function does. And I get a pair out. If I then take the first element of the pair, well, that's, of course, the same thing as getting F. But this is the only one that does that for a particular way of pairing up two items. Now, I could have used um, a wrapper, like I wrapped a single item with a sum using the maybe constructor. I could have made a wrapper that held two items. Or I could use an array with two items. Um, I could have stored A first and B second, or vice versa. There are lots of different ways of encoding a pair, but given any particular encoding here, there's a unique way of getting a pair that's the application of F and the application of G to the same element of Z. And then I can project off the first and second elements to get the re same result as applying one of those. So in the way we've been coding it in these examples, it would be prod n paren bracket a comma b. So with a and b are contracts, this thing produces a new contract that expects this pair. If, on the other hand, instead of contracts here, we put in functions, guarded functions, f and g, where f goes from z to a and g goes from z to b, then this new product would be a function from um, a pair of z's to an A and a B pair. Now we would have this one, this thing here is not prod n fg. Because this goes from prod n z z to prod n a, B. This has two Z's, this only has one. So this thing is really prod n F G composed with the duplication. So first you duplicate Z and then you apply F and G to the first element of that pair. Um, but still, there's a unique way of getting from Z to a pair such that the first and second operations on the pair match applying f and g to that single element of z. z. Okay, one more, just for fun. We've got mitochondrial Eve. Our objects are people. And our morphisms are matrilineal ancestry. And we, just to make it a category, we toss in the idea that you are your own zeroth matrilineal ancestor. Um, but, of course, if we have A to B, A is a matrilineal ancestor of B, means if this isn't the trivial zeroth um, level ancestor, then A has to be female. So Alice is an ancestor of Bob but you're never going to get Archie is a matrilineal ancestor of Betty. Okay. 
So here we have Eve of A and B is a matrilineal ancestor of A, matrilineal ancestor of B, such that for any other matrilineal ancestor of A and matrilineal ancestor of B, call her Zelda, she is a matrilineal ancestor of Eve. Eve is the nearest common matrilineal ancestor. So say we have Alice is the daughter of Jane, Bob is the daughter of Karen, and these two are daughters of Miriam. And she is the daughter of Anne. All right, so the nearest common ancestor of A and B, matrilineal ancestor, here is Miriam. So Miriam is the mitochondrial Eve of Alice and Bob. Now, given any other matrilineal ancestor of Alice and Bob, like Anne, she is an an matrilineal ancestor of Eve. If we chose someone that was farther back than Eve, like, say, Zelda, then we could choose Miriam as the competitor, and she would not be an ancestor of Zelda. Um, so the nearest common matrilineal ancestor of two people is their mitochondrial Eve. Now if you choose everyone in the world currently alive and take their nearest common matrilineal ancestor, that would be some woman that lived, as far as scientists know, about 200,000 years ago. Um, that's much, much later than the Y chromosomal Adam, who is the patrilineal ancestor, nearest common patrilineal ancestor. He apparently lived around 380,000 years ago. Um, so, Lots of different ways of getting a product. So, just to recap, we had minimum, we had GCD, we had intersection, we had the Cartesian product, or in other words, Prod N. We had Eve. All of these are categorical products. Now it turns out that if you turn around every arrow in each of those diagrams, then you get a dual notion. And no surprise, these are coproducts. And Whereas before you had minimum, here you get maximum. Whereas before you had least common multiple, I'm sorry, whereas before you had greatest common divisor, here you get least common multiple. Um, intersection, the dual is union. The pairs of things, uh, tuples, here you get option. Uh, so I guess option in Scala is, is just plus one. Uh, it's called either in scholar. Um, we have cases, so the switch case operator um, in C, enumerations. In sets they call it disjoint union or plus. 
All of those are synonyms for the same operation of saying either one of these or one of those. Eve, there's no dual. Um, it would have to be the youngest common descendant. Um, but because everyone doesn't have children with everyone else, um, that common descendant um, doesn't necessarily exist. It may exist for particular groups of objects, um, you know, that these two married and they happen to have a common descendant. And so you could ask whether two people have a common descendant, but it doesn't always exist like Eve does. 